challenge is actually really, really near and dear to my heart because it turns out my research area as a professor is in different types of solar photovoltaic materials and energy. And one of the ways you can generate electricity from the sun is actually using fruit juice. Fly, right? Now it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, we actually make really good photovoltaic cells, okay? Um, in fact, some of them can get up to almost 50% efficiency, not quite, but almost 50%. Um, unfortunately, those are incredibly expensive. Right? So those ones where they keep breaking records with solar efficiency that 50% of the sunlight gets converted right to electricity almost, um, those might go on the space station where it's worth paying that much money. But if you want to put them on the roof of your house, you probably don't want to pay for a space station. Um, probably you want something for other affordable. So silicon-based solar cells, like the one that is in our courtyard, actually, if you've ever looked out in the courtyard, there's a solar display there. Um, those are really pretty good at solar energy, but they're still pretty expensive, right? They're about 20% efficient, but they cost a fair amount of money. Okay? Now that cost has been coming down, and it actually, for some people, is reasonable economically to think about putting silicon panels on your home. Um, in like 15 to 20 years, you're probably making money off of that. But that's still a long time. So what if we could find different technologies that were fundamentally more affordable, but still also worked well? And that's where the type of solar cell you're going to make comes in. So this is called a dye-sensitized solar cell. So if you look at your packets, you can see that's the title of it, right? And a dye-sensitized solar cell is, is similar to a silicon cell, except that it's now, instead of just made out of silicon, it's made out of what we call a semiconductor. So it's made out of a TiO2 semiconductor. And this TiO2 semiconductor is what does a lot of the work. So I'll explain a semiconductor to you briefly. A semiconductor is a material that when you hit it with energy at a specific wavelength, so a specific type of energy, you can take an electron and you can give it that energy. Okay? Makes sense? So a semiconductor has areas where electrons live. So there are electrons in a semiconductor. Okay? And those electrons normally live in what we call a valence band. Okay? If you hit it with sunlight, or if you hit it with energy, you can take one of those electrons and excite it up here into what is called the conduction band. This, this electron is excited. And it can zoom around, and that's what gives you electricity. Okay. So what's really important is you have this gap here that only this electron that gets excited by the energy can turn into electricity. Because what electricity is, when you put a load onto a circuit, what you're doing is you're going to use that energy, that extra energy here, and then cause that electron to fall back down into this ground state. Okay, so that's what it is. So the semiconductor is important because conductors, conductors have these two things, but they're right next to each other, which means that any electron doesn't really absorb energy in order to move, like it just absorbs, it just will move no, almost no matter what. So it doesn't have any energy you can use. Insulators, like wood or plastic, don't have these bands. So an electron might get excited, but it can't move, it gets stuck, it just falls back down. Semiconductors in between, you can excite the electron and then that electron can move. And that's the key to photovoltaic cells. So your semiconductor is TiO2, as I've mentioned. But there's a problem with TiO2. So I have some samples of TiO2 here. Um, it's kind of a clear vial. I'll open this up. Um, incidentally, TiO2 is a very common compound, very common chemical. You see it? It's a nice white powder. Okay. This is actually used in a lot of sunscreens. It's used in a lot of white paints. Um, it's very common. What's the problem with this if you want to make a solar cell? So it does do this semiconducting part pretty well. But what do you think is wrong with this? Why won't this work? It doesn't work by itself. 
No, it's white. What does that mean? Is it absorbing any light? No. Exactly. Ah, it's white. You can't absorb any lights. If you can't absorb any sunlight, how are you going to turn it into electricity? You can't. The problem with TiO2 is that this gap is too big. It's bigger than the energy of the sunlight. It's too big. What we need to do We need a dye molecule to absorb the light and pass it the electron to the TiO2. All right, so I don't know why I bothered writing that. I couldn't have said it. But, um, but that's what we're going to do. So you're going to build a device where this is the key semiconductor, but we need to help it absorb sunlight, and that's where the fruit juice comes in, or whatever you decide to try and use. Okay? You're actually going to extract the dye. Now, the fruits can be very colorful, right? That's exactly the point. It's that colorful dye that you're going to extract and soak this TiO2 in. And what's going to happen is that those dye molecules are going to attach to your TiO2, and that's what's going to absorb the sunlight and allow you to make electricity from the sun. So it's two things. You have to absorb sunlight and you have to have a semiconductor and that's what the, that's what the dye sensitized solar cell does. It gives you both. Does that make sense? Cool, huh? I think so. So let's talk a little bit about the specifics of this, of this challenge. So um, I'll pass some more out uh, later, but these, this packet actually has a pretty detailed list of instructions in terms of how to construct your cell. You're not going to be on your own. You don't have to go out and figure out how to build a solar cell all by yourself. So that's, that's a little, uh, maybe asking a little too much. Uh, but what you are going to have to do is get good at it. All right? This looks really nice and easy in all these little pictures. But guess what? The first time you try and do it, it's probably, it's probably not going to be that easy. Right? It's like anything else. You kind of, get, kind of got to learn. You got to learn the process. You got to get your hands used to making these things. Right? And so um, you're going to want to try a few times. And then you're also going to want, the real key to this is figuring out what process you think gives you the best cell design. Now, you're going to stick to the directions here. So you're going to use the same basic things. But you know maybe things like how long do you heat it when it's on the hot plate? We're going to talk about that in a second. How thick a slurry of TiO2 do you actually make and apply? How thin the film? These little things are just going to kind of be something you're going to get a sense of as you build the cells. And the other major component is what dye do you use? What is the best natural dye to sensitize this TiO2 and make the best um, solar cell out of it? So there's lots of options out there, right? I think, I don't know, just in this packet, I've, I've listed some suggestions. I don't remember, but you know, I don't know, strawberries, blackberries, pomegranate, uh, red cabbage, tomatoes. All these are very highly colored fruits and vegetables, where if you can extract the dye out of them and attach it to the TiO2, which one works best? Okay. Does that make sense? So. That's your challenge. Now, the device you make will actually be judged um, in terms of its performance on the day of. Okay? And it, it will be judged in terms of both the current you can produce and the voltage you can produce. Okay? Now, these are two separate measurements that are described in this packet, and I'll go over them in just a second. But I want to just say before we talk about this that. The, those measurements are going to be standardized on the day of the competition. So you're going to bring your, your last solar cell not completed yet. You're not going to have finished it. You're going to bring it almost finished. And on the day of the competition, I will add the final component, the electrolyte, and then test each one so I test them exactly the same. Okay? That way we have a, a uniform measurement. Okay? And so as you're building it, you'll read this. This says this at the very end of here. Um, we are going to actually only look at a one centimeter squared volume. So as you build your cell, you can make it bigger than a one centimeter by one centimeter square, and you probably should. The one I have pictured here is slightly bigger than that. But make sure that the area of your cell is at least one centimeter by one centimeter. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put a little mask, a black mask that has exactly that one centimeter by one centimeter hole, and that's going to have the test test. That way everyone gets tested exactly the same. Does that make sense? So it doesn't matter if there's variation in how big you build it, or how big you build it, as long as you have that area that we can test. It's the same for everybody. So first thing with this project, safety is the most important concern. 
okay, as with all projects. So one, you have to have a lab to do this. Okay, you're going to be dealing with chemicals, and none of the chemicals are particularly dangerous, but they are still chemicals. Okay? If you need to have a lab space, you need to have a fume. If you don't have access to that, contact Rory here at the works, and we'll set something up so that you do have access to that to do this challenge. Okay? You have to have access to that. Safety glasses, not these glasses, safety glasses and or goggles must be worn while you do this. Okay? You are dealing with liquid chemicals and some fine powders. Your eyes must be protected. Okay, like I said, it's very unlikely anything's going to get up there, but if something happens to you, you must be protected. Same thing, you must wear lab gloves when dealing with these. Okay? These chemicals, as I said, they're not particularly dangerous, but they can irritate your skin, and if a lot gets on you and you're, doing, and you're careful about it, they can cause you harm. So you must wear gloves. That said, if something does happen, if you get chemical on you or you get powder on you, whatever, the correct thing to do is just go to the sink, flush with cold water for five to ten minutes, and you should be fine, okay? But of course, also let someone know, let whoever your part, person in charge is or whoever's helping you with the experiment uh, know that this has happened, all right? So that should be fine. The only other specific problems or challenges here that you have to worry about in terms of safety, you're gonna actually be heating glass and cooling glass, okay, throughout this process. Be patient with this. Do it slowly. If you heat glass, if you basically take a piece of glass and put it on a very hot surface, it can shatter, okay, it can break. Same thing, if you take a very hot piece of glass and put it on a cold surface, it can shatter, it can break. So when you do this process, make sure you are patient with the heating and cooling. Let it heat up gradually, let it cool down gradually so that you don't break the glass or shatter, okay? That's important. And never work alone, as I said before. Make sure there's at least somebody else in the room with you when you're working on these things in case some crazy accident happens, you want to be safe, okay? So safety first, um, the materials that you're going to get, I'll, I'll come over here and show them to you one by one. So uh, one thing I will say, uh, the Denison Chemistry Department is actually loaning you a number of these materials and uh, we want them back. So make sure that you do bring them back on the day of STEM Fest if you do this challenge. Um, scotch tape, which seems innocuous but is actually quite important. Everyone gets the same roll of scotch tape. Everyone gets the same thing of binder clips here, which it's not really as important, but these work pretty well. Everyone's going to get a glass microscope slide, which apparently I forgot, so I'll have to pick one up for you. But you can use one of these. You're going to get these slides. All you need is a flat edge, so a flat, flat edge slide. Um, you're going to get conducting glass slides. So these slides here, I think I have an open box. I'll open one up if I have to anyways. These are actually pretty cool. They're glass slides, but on one side they are coated with something called fluorine doped indium tin oxide. Very fancy. All that means is that it's a thin, clear layer that conducts electricity. So one side of these, if I can get them open, there we go. So here's, here's the actual things you're going to build your cell out of. Okay? They look totally clear. One side of these conducts electricity, and one side of these doesn't conduct electricity at all. How are you going to know which is which? Well, that's step one in your directions. You're going to use a multimeter. So Denison is going to loan you one of these multimeters. And if uh, you'll see on page two where it starts the instructions here, there's a little picture of that multimeter. And you'll see several of those pictures. Where that dial is tells you kind of where to look. So you can match up the picture. If you set up the wires correctly, so set up the wires as in the picture here, and if you turn the dial, so right now I'm measuring resistance. If I see the right side of this, correct side of this, I'll get a reading. Right? So that is the conductive side. If I flip this over, see how it just says one and nothing else is going on. And it still says one and nothing else is going on. Right? One side of these conducts, one side doesn't. But you can't tell by looking at it, so make sure you test. Once you figure out which side conducts, don't forget which side that is. Okay? Keep track of that. That's important. If you build it on the wrong side, it's not going to work. All right, so that's step one. The next step is actually making a film, a thin film of TiO2 on this. The directions are here. You're going to use the scotch tape to tape this to a surface, okay? The scotch tape not only holds it in place, but it also is just the right thickness to make your film. So it actually is also the spacer. The thickness of the tape is the spacer that helps you make the right film. So it's kind of cool. Um, you're going to then take your TiO2. So weigh out about half a gram of TiO2. I've given about three to four grams out to start with. If you need more of any of these materials, just ask Rory, we'll get them to you, okay? But you're gonna take 
or your TiO2, about half a gram. You're going to put it into a mortar and pestle that you'll also be provided with, just in case you don't have one. Look at this copper tape. I'll get there in a second. It's cool. All right, there we go. Mortar and pestle here. So put your half a gram in here. And you've got two vials that look the same. One is acetic acid. It says acetic acid on it. Okay. One is isopropanol. It says isopropanol on it. Don't use that one yet. You're going to use about 15 drops of acetic acid for half a gram of TiO2. You're going to mix it up real good. It's going to make a really pasty thing that sticks to everything. Scrape it off, mix it up, or scrape it off again, keep scraping it, use it, scrape it, scrape it until it's all mixed really well. You might have to add a few more drops of acetic acid until it's kind of a nice pasty type thing that you can then transfer to your slide and pull that with your another glass slide and make a nice thin film as it shows in the directions. Make sense? Once you've done that, as shown, um, actually, I think I brought, I want to finish on, and I did bring another one. Once you've done that, okay, it's time to center it. So you've got to, sorry. sorry. No, 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 no. So sorry. Sorry, it was, uh, you got to center it, burn off the acetic acid, okay, and any other organics, and that's what happens in the hot plate. So you place it on the hot plate while the hot plate is cool. You then crank the hot plate up and it's going to get really, really freaking hot, all right? Don't touch it. Um, that's going to take about 10, 15, 20 minutes. It'll actually turn a little brown, okay? That's fine. Eventually that brown color should mostly dissipate, may not completely dissipate, and that's how you'll know you're just about done, okay? Turn that hot plate off and let it sit there. Don't touch it. It's really hot, okay? Like way, way hotter than anything you should touch. Um, let it cool for about 10 minutes. Once it's just pretty hot <laughs> and not, oh my goodness, I would melt my face if I went near that, um, then you can take it carefully off that hot plate, okay? But like I said, be patient here because if you put it on a hot, hot plate or if you take it off a hot plate and set it on the counter, it can shatter. Okay? We don't want that. All right, then, and this part's mostly up to you, you gotta extract your fruit dye. So you're gonna, or whatever dye, I don't know, it doesn't have to be fruit, but it, it has to be something that you like find. You can't like go to a dye company and be like, give me the dye, that's not that's cheating. Um, you gotta extract it from something, okay? So you can do many things. I have given you, that's what this isopropyl alcohol is for, depending what you're using, okay? A little warm water can mish up some fruits and some warm water. Um, you might add a little bit of isopropyl alcohol. What that'll do is it'll help extract that dye out a little bit. It's going to create a slurry that has that dye in it. You can see in this little picture here, I've got a, like kind of a red slurry, right? Um, so that's it. I just took it out. I tried to keep most of the fruit matter out of that slurry, so it's, it's mostly liquid. Um, and then once I have that, I just take my TiO2 slide. I only need a little bit sitting in that watch glass, and I just dip it in there and let it sit. And that dye just soaks up into it and attaches to the surface. All right? Set that aside, let it dry, and then you've got to make, hello, come on in. Then you've got to make your counter electrode. All right? Your counter electrode, it's actually really simple. You take another piece of your same FTO, determine which side's conductive, and with, hold it with some tongs, so hopefully you'll have some tongs, and whoever's helping you at the time is going to light a match. And that's really all there is to it. And you're just going to pass this under the flame, and you're going to blacken the surface with the match. What you're really doing is you're creating soot on that. And so if you look at that, I mean, there it is. See, it looks just like a sooty piece of glass, right? It turns out carbon, that sooty carbon, is actually a decent conducting material that's a little different than the TiO2 on there. And that is going to be your other electrode. It's that simple. So it only takes a few seconds in the flame to blacken it. All right, you don't got to go overboard. You don't got to like torch it or anything. That's not going to help. Um, once you've done that, you have your two slides. Now you've got your blackened electrode and you've got your fruit dyed TiO2. You're going to stick them together, but you're going to stick them together so that one edge of each of them is, is hanging off a little bit like that. So they're not totally overlapped, right? Because after you stick them together, you're going to bind them together with these little clips. See, they're just stuck on there like so and you're going to put a little piece of copper tape on each side. That's your lead. That's how you connect it. Okay? So the tape, copper tape is actually super cool. It's really sticky and sticky, really conductive. And what that allows you to do then, this is a finished, uh, almost finished cell. Um, after you, 
After you have this set up, you're going to add a drop of your electrolyte solution. That's this. You don't need much, you just need one or two drops. So these are in little medicine dropper bottles. Um, be careful with these. Okay. That, that electrolyte solution is going to slide in and fill your cell, and you now have a working solar cell that you just built out of TiO2 and fruit juice. That's cool. All right. Um, when you actually go to test your cell, there are several um, pictures in here that actually show the settings to test for both current and voltage. Now, the numbers you get in terms of like what light source you use are not that important as long as you're consistent between trials. On the day of Stemfest, everything will be normalized, right? So I'll use the same light source, I'll use the same dye, I'll use everything the same. So on that actual day, everyone will be tested exactly the same. Prior to that, all that matters is your relative tests. Right? So if you have two cells, one with blueberries and one with, I don't know, apple juice, it's probably a terrible idea, it's not very colorful, but say you did it, and you tested the blueberry and the apple juice cell, make sure you're using the same light source each time so you can compare the numbers that come out of that. Okay? And that's it. And then you bring the cell and, and it's all there is to it. So, sorry, there's a fair amount to that. I hope all those directions are very clearly spelled out in this packet. Um, and your job is to get comfortable with building these cells and then choose and extract the best dyes and test them and see what works. Any questions about that? Yes? Um, I have two. The first, how do you filter out the organic matter? That's a great question. Um, so, you don't have to be pristine about it. Like, if you own a centrifuge, you can use that. But you probably don't. Um, so, I wouldn't use a piece of filter paper. The reason is that filter paper is going to suck up basically all the liquid. When I did it, I just really carefully, I just decanted it. I really carefully, I took my, my spatula and held it on the lip of whatever I was doing and really carefully just let only the liquid by. That seemed to work okay. If you look at your thing and there's like pieces of fruit stuck to it after you got the dye, I would probably pick those off <laughs> just so they don't get in the way. Um, good question. Yeah, but if you're in like a high-tech lab, you'd use a centrifuge, but otherwise just be careful. And then with the copper tape, is it one piece that's oh, yeah. longer than the width of the tube? Uh, so uh, here, I'm going to give you this. This is a big thing, and then you can just tear a piece off. Yeah, it's copper, but it rips. Cool. Um, and then you can just uh, uh, put like a, yeah, like that, and then it'll just stick to it. Whatever. So that's just sticking to the edge uh, here. And the only point of that copper tape is the glass is very hard. It doesn't make a very good contact.